When Michael Parsons envisioned his Montessori inspired micro school in Charleston, West Virginia earlier this year, he knew that he wanted to create an intentionally small learning environment where each child's individual strengths could be nurtured and needs could be met. He also valued a mixed age classroom model similar to a one room schoolhouse where young people could be in community together while working on academic content tailored to their individual learning levels. Ample time hiking outside and walking to various local sites such as the public library were also key priorities. Michael pieced all of that together when he opened Vandalia Community School this fall in a cozy rented church space adjacent to a trail system near Charleston's vibrant community resources. I had the pleasure of meeting Michael and visiting Vandalia earlier this month, and I'm thrilled to introduce him to all of you today. Michael Parsons, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Thank you, and thanks for having me here. And coming to visit us um, earlier this month. It was such a treat to see what you've built, especially in such a short period of time, just opening um, earlier this fall and already seeing what you've been able to create with Vandalia. Uh, and then to look at what the future holds, not only for your micro school, but for the micro school movement in West Virginia overall, I think that we're really on the beginning of something great there. So it was exciting to be able to travel around the state and see uh, what's happening already and the promise of what's to come. So I appreciate the time that you spent with me and, and again, appreciate your time today. So, Michael, maybe we can start with a little bit of your background of how you became interested in education and kind of got to this point as an education entrepreneur. Sure. So um, my background is a little eclectic. Um, I've done several things uh, from uh, my degree is I have a chemistry undergrad and psychology undergrad. Um, my master's is in chemistry. Uh, and then after that, I taught at community college for a while. Um, interestingly, I was not teaching chemistry. Uh, my background in biochem was uh, interesting for the, the community college in relation to a brewing program. So uh, that was a lot of fun. We started that program up um, and it was a blast. And then there was uh, 2020. And so from that point, everything became uh, a little unstable in terms of, uh, you know, what my family needed uh, changed and what options were available to anybody, uh, be it work or um, what was at the grocery store or <laughs> anything, uh, you know, that kind of um, went into upheaval for everyone. And during that time, uh, my wife actually left her job and homeschooled our kids. Uh, we were a little nervous about that change, especially uh, socially, but it was really interesting because during the lockdowns, uh, we met like several kids on our street that we didn't even know lived here. Um, and that was really good for the kids. They got to form friendships on the street that uh, maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise, and they still keep those friendships. So uh, that turned out being a really good experience socially, uh, as well as academically. They were able to get even more individualized focus than they were already getting at uh, Charleston Montessori School, which was uh, a great experience for us as well. My wife actually uh, works there again now, and our youngest daughter is in her classroom. Um, our oldest two children are in my classroom at Vandalia. Um, and so we, we asked ourselves for years, really, 
uh, what's next? Because the Montessori schools, um, at, at least in this area, they don't go through high school. And uh, for, for our kids and, uh, you know, even our kids, they have individual needs that are different. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe transferring and doing high school for public school uh, might be good for one, but uh, not as much of a, a thriving environment for the other one. Uh, and then the youngest one, still figuring it out. Um, but uh, that said, we had been kind of on the lookout for uh, somebody to do something different for high school and to have some options. Uh, as the pandemic came along and it uprooted their routine anyway, as we went back into school, we actually uh, switched schools to another Montessori school that went through eighth grade instead of sixth grade. Um, and we were there for a year. Uh, and from that point, I was looking at it and decided if we're making another switch, um, it, it's time to just go for it. Um, and from there, I, I originally started with the idea of like a homeschool co-op. Um, and as I was researching that, there was some legislation that had very recently gone through uh, that gave some specific definitions to uh, homeschool co-ops, uh, micro schools, learning pods, and as I read through several of the different options, micro school sounded perfect. Um, it was the perfect blend for us between that really intense attention uh, that they can receive at, in homeschool. And it created more social opportunities and opportunities for things like uh, field trips and and more resources than I could offer uh, just as a homeschooling parent, or at least that I was aware that I could offer. Um, and so from June to August, uh, I very quickly <laughs> pulled together the pieces and opened Vandalia uh, in August. And it has been, uh, a wild ride so far, but a lot of fun. And I think that, uh, I think that it's going well. The students seem to be happy. The parents seem to be happy. Uh, and we're all learning things. I love this story. I love kind of your, your personal connection to, uh, entrepreneurship and developing Vandalia as a Montessori inspired micro school. And I also love kind of the connection to your professional background and teaching at the community college level. Uh, I will say that when I visited Charleston, I was um, impressed by the local craft brew scene there. It's sort of become a hub of craft beer and there's some really good uh, IPAs that I enjoyed. So I can see why that would be of interest to, uh, to local um, students. And I know when we spoke, when I visited your school, that one of your community college students went on to create her own brewery, to open her own brewery uh, in the Charleston area. So exciting to see what's happening there and the kind of another area of entrepreneurship. And then obviously mm -hmm. really great to see the small school movement there in, in this micro school um, momentum. So I'm curious, Michael, if you can talk a little bit about what was it about micro schooling that really attracted you, right? You, so you said you, you know, you had been homeschooling, you liked that individualized approach, um, wanted something slightly more consistent and social for the kids, but didn't want to go with a traditional private school, uh, even though, of course, you and your wife had experience with a traditional Montessori school in Charleston. So what, what is it about the micro schooling model that's so appealing? I think. Um... There are a few things, but I think two of the, the really big ones are 
um, flexibility, and ironically, consistency. Um, and in consistency, what I'm talking about is that uh, I feel like as schools get larger and larger, even if we're talking relatively small private schools, um, some do a really good job of keeping a, a good thread from uh, the earlier classrooms up through the higher classrooms. The teachers work really well together in some cases. Um, but as you go a step further than that even, and you have multiple classrooms in different levels, uh, it does start to kind of feel like there, you know, maybe it's not as uh, as consistent from uh, not just classroom to classroom in that level, but, um, you know, the teachers preparing the students to move up to the next classroom. Sometimes uh, that preparation looks different if they're going over here versus over here. And uh, so one of the things that I really like about the micro school model is that the students really learn what to expect. They know what to expect from their teacher. They know what to expect from their routines. Um, and while expectations are differentiated from, you know, level to level uh, or student to student based on their needs, uh, the general flow of things stays the same and they have that predictability. On the flip side, um, being a small school allows us to really take advantage of things like our hiking trail. Um, even in a case where uh, we don't have many teachers, we have just myself and Britt Comer, which is uh, all we need right now. And uh, it works really well. Britt is wonderful with the kids and brings a lot to the table. And so with that small group, we're able to take them out hiking every day. Um, we're able to shift gears when we feel like we need a break and just go out into town. Uh, we've been to the library. Last week, we walked to the Clay Center um, to watch a planetarium show. Uh, and that was something else that was important to me. I talk a lot about, um, about the trails and getting out in nature, but something else that was really important to me is uh, teaching the students both how to utilize and how to contribute to their community at large and how to use resources like the library, uh, but also how to uh, contribute to those and maintain them so that they're there generations from now too and that that we have an awesome library uh, 10 years from now our library is amazing I love it um, they have a maker space and all kinds of cool stuff so um, that was really important to me and our location ended up being perfect for that because we can just go on a walk, we walk down the trail and out to the library. So that is really hard to maintain as the school gets bigger. Um, you know, we move past 20, maybe 30 students and then going to the library as a whole school, uh, even if it's manageable for us, might be overwhelming to the library or maybe if not the library, some other place that we might wanna go. And there's a lot more coordination, a lot more planning that has to be involved. Um, we need, because we don't have a bus system, uh, we would need more parent volunteers to drive and our parents are very involved, but we go back to more coordination more planning and it's hard to just shift gears um, because this week we decided, hey, let's do something, let's do an experience. So that flexibility 
uh, was really important to me because if I'm not really flexible, then it is hard to follow what the classroom needs or what each student needs um, in the moment. Yeah, and West Virginia is interesting in that it's uh, a state that passed this microschooling legislation that you mentioned earlier this year, kind of the beginning of 2022, to uh, better define what microschools are and separate them from, as you said, independent homeschooling and learning pods and private schools, uh, and and really. Um, you know, give a name to this movement. And so you're, you're very much a part of that. Students who participate in micro schools are assessed annually, uh, mm -hmm. whereas homeschoolers are assessed um, slightly less regularly. But for micro schoolers, there's either standardized tests that they can take or portfolio review. Uh, and in that way, it is this blend between private schooling and homeschooling. And it's been great mm -hmm. to see in West Virginia, as well as um, around the country, different kinds of educational philosophies and approaches that are being pursued in these micro schools. So for you, it's this Montessori method. For other micro schools, it could be um, it could be classical models, it could be faith-based models, it could be, um, you know, other kinds of eclectic educational philosophies and approaches. So maybe you could talk a bit about how the day runs or how the week runs at Vendalia, specifically how the Montessori approach is woven in to this mixed age classroom uh, and your overall model. Yeah, sure. Um, so, First disclaimer, um, I do draw very heavily from the Montessori approach, but uh, that's not the only place we draw. Uh, so what I describe in here won't necessarily sound exactly like a Montessori school, but uh, there are definitely some common threads. Um, one of the things that I really love about that model is that uh, one of the most important tools for the teacher is observation. Um, so one of the things that really guides my lessons and not just uh, the academic content that I present in those lessons, but how I present them, how I group students to come to the lesson, um, that information comes from observing the students directly. Uh, keeping notes on how they're working together or, uh, you know, how long can a lesson go before they kind of start to lose it and they're not uh, gaining anything from the lesson after a certain period of time and what do I need to do to break that up or shorten it. So uh, that observation piece from Montessori is something that I... Uh, I can't see myself ever separating from that. Um, another thing that, that I really like is uh, the freedom within limits um, because it's important to me that the students have that freedom uh, to move around. It's productive. They're able to uh, advocate for themselves and to do what they need to do so that learning can continue. But there are also boundaries that uh, sometimes that's set strictly by the adults. Uh, sometimes that's set democratically with the students and uh, they get a lot of say in that. Uh, but it allows us to keep the room functioning uh, so that it's not too wild, uh, but at the same time gives them the space to do what they need, including sometimes being a little bit wild. Um, so I really like that. And uh, I like the emphasis on uh, starting different concepts with a story uh, and looking for that way to get students interested in the topic and connected to it uh, before trying to teach it. So sometimes that might just be a story. Sometimes I might do a demo of some kind and um, 
you know, launch a rocket. We did that when we opened up our, uh, our space unit that we did between Thanksgiving and Christmas um, on one of the very first days we started doing that, we went out to the parking lot, launched a small rocket, um, and then circled back to that and closed the unit with a trip to the, uh, the independent verification and validation center in Fairmont. So NASA has an outreach program there, uh, an educational outreach program. Uh, and on Friday, uh, we actually drove up there because small school and uh, the two teachers actually can fit all of the students in our car. Uh, so we you loaded have about up. 10 students, right, Michael? Yes, we have 10 students. And two teachers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we loaded up in the cars and we took off to Fairmont um, and uh, launched rockets with, uh, with this group at NASA that um, it, it was the first workshop they've held in about three years uh, on site. So we kind of got to break the ice there, which was really cool. Um, and the kids really loved that experience of uh, kind of starting off with this small rocket demo and then going and doing this really cool thing to close it out. We circled back to the rockets, but this time, uh, you know, we're shooting rockets much higher um, and we're doing it uh, with, you know, with this uh, outreach team from NASA and uh, at one of NASA's facilities. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was it was a really cool way to end that. Uh, so I like that uh, approach of kind of pulling them in. Uh, now, one of the things that's different in my classroom is that Montessori typically uses uh, three-year age ranges. And my age range is wider than that. Um, right now, we actually have uh, first through eighth grade. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting group. Uh, but it's interesting in watching how they work together and how they lead each other uh, whether that's socially or academically. Uh, and sometimes you don't see exactly what you would expect to see. Uh, sometimes somebody that you didn't expect to lead the charge jumps up and does that. Um, or something just clicks for this student and they're able to help other students get it, uh, much like a Montessori room, but a little wider range. Um, so I, I think those are kind of the main things I really like to pull from Montessori, uh, and, uh, and we, it's working really well. Yeah, it does seem to be working really well. When I visited and was able to observe for a while, I noticed, you know, full group, uh, experiences and conversations mm -hmm. that you were having as well as small group um, opportunities and individualized work. So it was really this lovely blend between kind of individualized learning and uh, peer learning and then that larger group setting. So uh, great to see that rhythm that you've created there. Now your students are, some are neurotypical, some are neurodiverse. You have a really um, diverse group of students. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that and especially what you may have noticed um, for students who may be more neurodiverse, uh, how does the microschooling environment benefit them especially? Mm -hmm. So that was something that's really important to me. Um, it is very important to me that uh, neurodiverse students are able to integrate into uh, the social setting to the extent that that's comfortable for them and that they want to. And sometimes that's a lot and sometimes that's a little less. 
Uh, and the micro school approach gives the flexibility for us to be able to accommodate those needs. Um, it also is really important to me that neurotypical students do the same thing, that they're able to integrate with other people, that they're able to have exposure to that and understand um, people who think or behave differently, and that they're able to enjoy and work with those personalities when they leave our school as well. Um, and it provides that same flexibility in what they, what our neurotypical students can have socially as well. Uh, sometimes they want a lot, sometimes not as much. And so it was really important to me to have a space that felt uh, safe and comfortable and nurturing for any student. Um, and kind of, kind of unfortunately, uh, what, whether a student is neurotypical or neurodiverse uh, tends to come in to play in education um, in how accommodations are made more so than I would like to see. Um, and I talk about that neurodiversity in our room, um, but really what I want to see in our room is just a space where people can be themselves comfortably and that that is supported. Uh, and it's something that, uh, that I love watching in our room because even on uh, you know days that it's a little rocky, somebody's not getting along with somebody. There's you know this moment of drama. I have middle schoolers. Um, you know, there's always going to be a little. Uh, it's just that kind of fleeting bickering, um, but there's no singling out and. Uh, picking at anybody for for those tendencies, even when they're frustrating, um, because the students are able to take space if they're really frustrated with someone uh, or something that's going on, regardless of which student that is. Um, and uh, and with that, they've learned to really work together, and they talk openly about. Uh, you know, how they feel or how their brain works. Uh, nobody in the room really seems to want to hide that about themselves. They're, you know, they're proud of their differences and work together really well. And I've seen, uh, I've seen two different things happen. I've seen some of our neurodiverse students who struggled socially um, before really come out of their shells and, uh, you know, be able to have close, meaningful friendships. And I've also seen some of our neurotypical students that didn't uh, have the, the same opportunities to interact with neurodiverse students um, that at first seemed kind of flustered and off-put by uh, some of the, the things that might happen socially um, that now have come to understand and accept that. And they just go right with the flow and they're best of friends. Um, and everybody is, is really accepting of that. And it's been a good learning experience and has let us go further in academics than we could have gotten if other needs weren't being met. So uh, that, that blend and a blend of uh, a socioeconomic blend and a, uh, just a diverse blend from 
from any background, whether that's ethnicity, race, uh, income level, or uh, neurodiverse, it, it is really important to me that we have a rich mix of students um, that's representative, if not of the world, at least of our region, um, because that is something that's possible. And uh, I'll, I'll do whatever can be done to attract that blend of students. And right now we have a really good uh, mix going on. We have a lot of neurodiverse students, but uh, we have some students that have recently immigrated to the United States. Uh, three of our students actually uh, are dual citizens. Um, two um, in the United States and Italy and one in the United States and Kenya. Uh, so we've got a really cool mix of uh, backgrounds and personalities and uh, it works really, really well. It is such a wonderful place. You can just tell that the kids are thriving uh, there. As soon as you walk in, there is just this sense of delight and um, a real love of learning and a love of the community. And it's great to see. So I wanted to ask a little bit more about access. You mentioned diversity in all kinds of ways, including socioeconomic diversity. Microschools, by their very nature, tend to be lower cost than traditional private schools, but still financially out of reach for some families. I wonder if you can talk about access a little bit more, especially in light of West Virginia's pioneering HOPE scholarship program, mm -hmm. a near universal education savings account program that allows almost every child in West Virginia to have access to a portion of the state allocated education funding, roughly $4,300 per student per year. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about access, especially in light of hope. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and with that, I'll, I'm actually going to hit two points um, in terms of hope because it does open up a lot of access, but there is, um, there is one area that I want to touch on that I think really could use some improvement. So to start with accessing the micro school itself um, and getting past that financial barrier, because I mentioned already, that's really important to me. Uh, it was not easy uh, getting our kids in private school and um, keeping them there. That was a huge financial, financial struggle for us. Uh, and having been through that experience, it's important to me to uh, have it accessible to anyone. So uh, part of that access comes with uh, and I'm sure there's a, a common theme that you've run into with micro school founders and uh, funding and, and that being limited. So part of that is a lot of work put in on our part, uh, be that myself directly or Brit or our parents um, and my wife, Bree, who jumps in and helps tremendously to find funding outside of tuition uh, because that keeps the, the cost down as much as we can. Uh, working with a small number of students could quickly drive tuition up really high uh, if we're trying to operate just on that. Um, and then the HOPE scholarship comes in to play as, like you said, a nearly universal uh, opportunity for students in West Virginia. Uh, and it was a little rocky over the summer. It was contested and uh, a lot of parents were expecting to use that and then they weren't able to use that. Uh, and then they were able to use that. But in the meantime, there was that gap of, we've pulled our kids out of public school We've made plans, we've enrolled in another school or in the process of enrolling uh, or looking for something different. And now that's off the table. It's not attainable anymore. So 
Um, one thing that I did to make it accessible to students that didn't have as many resources and they were counting on that Hope Scholarship uh, is that I just honored that scholarship. So um, the school honored that and we had a financial aid program that matched what they would have received in the Hope Scholarship um, as kind of a last in program. So uh, they got up to that $4,300 uh, if they were qualified to, to have Hope or apply for it. Um, but that allowed them to, to move forward and find somewhere that they chose to go. Uh, now, in terms of access with Hope Scholarship, there is uh, something that, that I hope is improved upon. So with the Hope Scholarship, um, it is mostly designed to support students who are leaving public school. Uh, it does not offer support right now in its current form for students who are already homeschooling or being private schooled. And uh, on one hand, that sounds like a little unfair. And on the other hand, it, in my opinion, becomes a little more, uh, I'm, I'm looking for the word, the word that came to mind was targeted, but it's, I, I don't feel that there's any deliberate targeting. It, affects some groups more than others. Uh, in my experience, particularly affects neurodivergent students more than neurotypical students, because at a, a higher rate, you have students with specific needs that are already out of public school uh, because their families felt like that environment wasn't working. Uh, they've moved to a private school or they're homeschooling already. Uh, and now this funding comes out and it's fantastic for people who want to leave public school, but it leaves out people who could really benefit from that funding uh, who have already left. And, and unfortunately that ends up being a little disproportionate. Um, so that's something that I hope is improved on as we go forward uh, and offers more assistance to those students who already needed it. Um, and there are some, some good models out there for offering that kind of assistance. I know uh, Ohio has some really interesting supports for students and uh, I hope that someday West Virginia has something uh, maybe not identical, but something that matches our needs here. Yeah, it's such an interesting point, Michael. And I and I am hopeful that Hope will eventually be expanded to become a truly universal education savings account program, as has been implemented in Arizona, which is now a, the first mm -hmm. in the country universal ESA. Um, to provide access to all students. I think that's such an interesting point about how you said that often the students who really could benefit from a micro school or some other kind of private model have already potentially left the public system previously mm -hmm. uh, for homeschooling or some other option and are currently excluded from accessing the HOPE dollars in West Virginia. But again, hopefully that will be uh, expanded sooner than later. So, you know, as we begin to wrap up our discussion today, Michael, I wonder if you can talk about what you see as the future of microschooling in West Virginia, not only for Vandalia, I know that you have said that you plan to continue to grow, but you want to sort of not be much more than 20 students per microschool to really retain that personalized small mm -hmm. learning environment, but you could see maybe opening additional micro schools. So that's something kind of on your personal radar, but how do you see that sort of fitting into where you see West Virginia going over the next, uh, say five years in terms of micro schooling and these more diverse learning models? Mm -hmm. So um, over the next five years, I hope to see this trend kind of catch on um, and create more options. Uh, for diverse learning models. Um, 
what I don't anticipate seeing or uh, even necessarily think is the the best thing overall, uh, I don't think that it's going to necessarily take the state by storm. I don't think that we're going to pull everybody out of public schools, nor do I think that we should. Um, I think public schools and larger private schools have a really important place in education uh, because it's infeasible to meet all of those needs through micro schools. Um, you know, as I was talking with someone uh, fairly recently about that, and I said, well, unless we have a school on every street, uh, we need all of those options available. Um, so maybe that's, that's 10 years then, Michael. 10 years we'll have 10, it on every street, but in five years. years. <laughs> <laughs> no, but five years, um, what I hope to see is uh, that we have enough capacity in those diverse learning models to meet the needs of the students who are looking for them. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, as Vandalia grows um, and we have more students and more people hear about what we're doing, that that's inspiring um, and that we have somebody else you know, take the plunge and try it out. Uh, and that that kind of cascades and, uh, and we have a lot of um, diverse options. And I hope that we can come to a point in the state where uh, micro schools and private schools and public schools are working together cohesively and not kind of at odds with each other. I would love to see a point where um, where those are, are all utilized in homeschool as well as tools to meet this generation's needs in education. Um, and I think that that some version of that could be feasible in five years. Uh, but what I think that's going to take is one more micro schools so that people even know what we're talking about when we say micro school. Um, and two, it's going to take more, uh, more effort on the part of, uh, micro school founders and on the part of, uh, private schools and public schools to come together and, you know, talk about these different models and learn each other's language, um, so that we're able to pull some resources and, um, and meet those needs more effectively. So I'm hoping that uh, what comes out of the next five years is that uh, West Virginia has a boom in micro schools and, uh, and even more so a boom in access to those schools because that both of those pieces are critical. Mm. Um, somebody has to open the schools before access is a discussion uh, and somebody has to attend the schools if they're gonna stay open. So what I'm hoping is that we just have a really uh, candid and productive conversation around education in the state so that, uh, so that we're meeting that goal and we're taking you know, talented educators and we're putting them in the most effective places. Some people who have, you know, really free spirits and they're ready to take a risk and, and just jump might be perfect for a micro school setting. Uh, somebody who wants more structure in that, more predictability uh, and really thrives in, uh, you know, in a particular area, uh, say chemistry, and they want to focus in on that, will do really well in a public school setting or sometimes a private school setting, depending on how that, that private school is set up and can really meet the needs of their students there. Um, you know, uh, I love chemistry. If I'm teaching strictly a chemistry class, I'm prone to ramble about 
you know, history or calculus too. Uh, so this really uh, comprehensive model works well for me because I love to uh, teach in a lot of different mm -hmm. topics. And um, I like the idea of creating something new, but uh, I hope more people will, because there are a lot of people. I met several uh, just at our listening session well, a week ago, almost two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, I met several people who are ready to take the plunge. And, uh, and I think that that could be really beneficial to students throughout the state. So mm, I don't know, maybe we can double the number of micro schools every year for five years. Start there. Um, right. And that would be a really amazing start. I, I completely agree. And you referred to the listening session that I facilitated with West Virginia education entrepreneurs a, yes. a couple of weeks ago and aspiring education entrepreneurs that was co-sponsored by the Cardinal Institute for West Virginia Policy and West Virginia Families United for Education. So it was great to see all of that energy and excitement around the possibilities of innovative education models and expanded mm -hmm. access to those models over the next yeah. several years. And I think that that's crucial. Glad that you brought that up too, because there is this important intersection between entrepreneurship and access. We need people like you, uh, these bold visionaries going out and creating new learning models and then continue to champion uh, increased access to these models through various education choice policies. So great to see that happening uh, in real time yes. in West Virginia. And I'm excited to see where, where things lead there over the next several years. Uh, so Michael, if my listeners and viewers want to connect with Vendalia Community School and follow you and your progress there, what is the best way for them to do that? Mm -hmm. So the best way to do that is probably uh, to email me. It's michael at vandaliacommunityschool.com. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that would be great. I would love to hear from people, uh, whether that's people in the area that have uh, seen this and they're interested in what we're doing in the school or people uh, nationally or in our state that, um, that wanna know more about our model or how we're doing this. I know um, there's the National Micro Schooling Center that has recently taken off and supporting, um, supporting educational entrepreneurs, specifically micro schools uh, in several states. And um, actually, I just came on board with them and uh, I'm helping to uh, support other uh, micro schools in West Virginia. So I'm really excited about kind of starting that venture and uh, working with the National Micro Schooling Center to be part of their support system uh, kind of in the bigger picture. So um, Don and Ashley, they're, they're awesome. Uh, I met with them over the summer and things just kind of took off from there. Uh, so I, I'm very interested in connecting and uh, collaborating and supporting uh, other potential micro schools. That's, that's so great. Yes, yeah, Don and Ashley Slafer, who run the National mm -hmm. Microschooling Center, they've been on the podcast before back in the spring. They're doing such phenomenal work in helping yeah. to activate microschooling across the country and support microschool founders and aspiring founders uh, in any way they can. So I'm thrilled to hear that you've teamed up with them. And I'm just so uh, excited to see what happens next for Vendalia, for the students that you're uh, helping you know, to really flourish and to achieve their full potential there and to see where microschooling in West Virginia goes uh, as well as across the country. So Michael Parsons, thank you again for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you for having me.